Well, again, thank you for joining us. My name is Alex Gordon. I am the Director of Sales at ETF Managers Group. As a quick compliance aside, I am a FINRA registered rep, and you can find all of our risk disclosures and prospectus information at ETFM as a manager, G as in group.com. ETFMG is a $7 billion boutique asset manager specializing in thematic ETFs. Uh, we are equipping investors with the tools direct to directly target industries and themes that have long-term growth, growth profiles. Uh, and through the ETF structure, you are able to get concentrated exposure uh, to a specific industry or theme without having to take on the single stock risk. Uh, some examples of those include Hack, our ETF targeting the cybersecurity industry, IPAY, IPAY, targeting the mobile payment sector, and AWAY, AWAY, targeting our travel tech fund. Uh, today, we are here to talk about cannabis. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to be joined by Jason Wilson, our cannabis research and banking expert, uh, and a little bit later by Chris Yeagley, the managing partner of Prime Indexes. Uh, just a brief note about them. Jason has an extensive background in banking and asset management and has been involved in the cannabis industry since its early days, helping raise capital for the company that became Canopy Growth. Uh, Chris was previously the head of U.S. Structured Product at UBS, and he and his team designed the indices and methodologies that many of our ETFs track. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason in just a second, uh, who's going to, to give us an update on sort of the state of the cannabis industry currently. Uh, and then we're going to go through some commonly asked questions. And please feel free to use the Q&A tab if you have any further questions. So Jason, I'll uh, turn it over to you. Great. Thanks. Uh, appreciate the intro. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, obviously, hopefully sooner rather than later, we'll get back to in-person meetings, but uh, first we'll have to do for now. Uh, you know, I, I won't talk too much regarding the, the state of the industry. I, you know, suffice it to say it's, it's growing like mad. I mean, if you look at year after year after year growth, not just in the U.S., but globally, we're seeing 30 to 40 percent per annum uh, annual revenue growth. The fundamentals for the industry are strong. We're seeing growth across many facets, not just by bigger addressable uh, markets, which is occurring through uh, continued legalization state by state in the US, but also country by country globally. But we're also seeing you know, a larger portion of the population that's actually starting to move from, I'll call it the can of curious consumer to actual cannabis consumer. And, and they're doing that because as the industry grows and matures, it's becoming less about you know, really the traditional forms of, of cannabis, I smoking, and more and more so about the derivative 2.0 product. So we're, we're seeing a lot of conversion um, in, in, the, uh, in the market out there. So all said and done, we're, we're, we're well on way right now to, to, for 2021 to see a year of north of $25 billion in global sales. And that's grown pretty much at about a, you know, five to $7 billion a year clip. Um, 11 states right now have, have actual active adult use programs. There's 18 that have, have approved. So, you know, keep in mind that everything we're seeing today, the sales growth we're seeing today is really just the first 11 states with adult use programs. There's 36 in total with recreational programs as well. But adult use is what's really driving the growth. At least it is in the United States. Uh, in, in Canada, it, it's, it's uh, about the same globally, specifically Europe, it's primarily all medical, although we're starting to see that change uh, with some recent initiatives. And if anyone's been watching, uh, you know, the Netherlands has finally moved to what they call the, their four-year experiment, which they're um, actually going to start having a, a full legal adult use market versus just decriminalized. So lot, lots of catalysts out there. Um, the big question is, you know, really, notwithstanding the fundamentals, what regulatory framework are we working in? It's incredibly fragment, uh, fragmented domestically. We know that and actually, you know, the judicial committee is actually um, voting on various amendments to the MORE Act as we speak. So maybe we'll get some more clarity on that by the end of this webinar, if not by the end of today. Obviously we saw the Safe Banking Act um, added to the uh, defense bill, which is must pass legislation. And of course, those, that's uh, at the Senate level, we have the CAOA, which is uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer's bill, which is really a discussion bill, but nevertheless, it's pretty meaningful to actually see cannabis legislation in the Senate. That's, that's a first. So lots going on, um, which means lots of questions. So Alex, I don't know, maybe I should turn it over to you to, our, I think you summarized kind of the top eight or nine questions we tend to get. Sure. And I think this, one's a, this one can be very open-ended here, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of different ways to answer this one, but when do you see cannabis being federally legalized? Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, if we only had a crystal ball, right? So, you know, I guess, I guess the right way to answer that is, A, no one knows the exact timeline clearly, but, but what do we know? So what we know is at a minimum, we have tremendous bipartisan support for, for a few things. One is at least decriminalization. We, we know we're gonna see some form of, of decriminalization, if not full out legalization. So, so that's on the table and passable. Uh, we know that there is strong support, uh, not just from a popular vote perspective, but also again in Congress, with respect to medical use and medical research, and that goes all the way up to the president. And then the other part we know is there, there, there is obviously strong, strong movement for what I call the restorative justice component. So that, that's kind of, kind of what's there on the table right now. Um, the Safe Banking Act is, doesn't really accomplish much of any of those. I mean, what it will do is help the industry deal with the public safety issues of, of transacting almost entirely in cash. So that's a piece of, of legislation that we can see to hopefully see move forward one way or the other, um, but that won't be legalization on its own. What we really need is, 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 a, is what's happening now. It's something less than the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act, which is um, tabled by Schumer. Something a bit less than that, as, as, as holistic as it is, it touches on, all, on everything we want for full legalization, for all the social equity and restorative justice components. Um, but there's lots of bits in it that, that have gone too far. Uh, specifically, there's a pretty heavy tax regimen in it, uh, amongst other things. So I think that's where we're going to get pushback in getting that through Senate. The MORE Act, obviously, is, is, comes something much lighter than that. It, it's more than decriminalization. It, it's, it's entire descheduling, which would result in legalization. Um, they're voting on amendments to remove some of the tax provisions in there right now but it also has some of the restorative justice components that we actually need. So, you know, we, we know that in some way, shape or form, we have the will to table the right bill, uh, either at the Senate level or at the House, and then obviously um, um, to move on across the other way. But the, you know, it, the, the time frame is, is, is here. We have our, you know, next elections coming up in 2022. Obviously, we could see a change of control in the Senate and potentially the House. Um, so because of that, there's a lot of momentum right now to get you know, as much done as possible. Will it be full legalization? I don't know. Uh, I would think at a minimum, we're going to see banking reform. It just makes sense. I know there's been a lot of questions surrounding, hey, we got to do more than just banking reform. And there's a lot of suggestions that there's certain members of Senate that will block just banking reform. But I think at the end of the day, you know, there will be a level of reasonableness to it and something needs to get done. Some kind of momentum needs to get done for the industry. And if it's as light as simple banking reform, I think that will get through. And the timeline for that is likely going, I, I would expect to see it in Q1 or Q2 of next year. So we have a number of measures on the table right now. I think there's gonna be a lot of, a lot of posturing and pushback and whatnot as to write the, what the proper measure is, but that should be coming out in the next you know, quarter or two and hopefully makes its way through. Obviously, everyone wants to get this done before the midterms come up uh, November next year. Okay. Um, so, I mean, again, a very broad open to question that we, we get a lot here. Maybe you can zero in and you, you, you kind of touched on a few of these in the last question, but what would you say are some of the benefits of cannabis legalization? Um, and, and can you give us a few examples and maybe some, uh, some, some, some figures? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, the just, just, just starting with the first one, economics is obviously what I'm sure most uh, many people uh, care about with, with respect to investing. It, it's just having legalization alone would, would give us the, the framework to allow businesses to operate a um, effectively and efficiently. If you look at uh, U.S. operators right now, they're doing incredibly well from a fundamental perspective. Um, but the fact that that cannabis is federally illegal results in, in, in you know, inefficient uh, capital raising, which can be diluted to shareholders. Obviously it also affects operating margins. Um, we also have a, a problem with, with health and safety issues, the fact that it's, uh, everyone's transacting in cash. So it increase the operational efficiency and safety of these businesses. Legalization beyond all of that, uh, you know, understanding whether or what interstate commerce looks like, that will really, you know, start creating a new, a new potential playing field 
And right now, everyone's kind of guessing. We have state by state in many instances, in almost every instance, these fully vertically integrated companies. And that doesn't necessarily need to be the case post legalization. So, you know, the, the, every, it could really start to change and open up interstate commerce, uh, which would help the whole industry grow in total. Uh, so those are, those are the benefits economically, is just to have that proper framework um, so that we're, you know, we can invest and these companies can grow, understanding the road ahead of them and uh, you know, all, all the challenges and opportunities. And then of course we have uh, uh, the expansion of medical research, incredibly important to understand exactly to help you know, move forward on helping cannabis become a therapeutic aspect to it as well. To move away, maybe can we you know, move away from opiates, for example. That's, that's the other part of it that federal legalization would really open up is the medical research that needs to happen with respect to, to cannabis. I mean, there's over 100 naturally occurring uh, organic compounds uh, that could have medical value in cannabis. It'd be a good and great to understand and run proper clinical trials to, to uh, take advantage of those. And then the other very important part of this, obviously, is the reformative justice component. It's incredibly, you look at the number of folks that are banned from getting jobs right now because of you know, um, simple marijuana possession offenses, uh, it, 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 there's, there's a, a tremendous amount of you know, people in jail for the wrong reason. And so that, that I mean, that's a trickier part to, to navigate, but it's an important part is to stop incarcerating people for the wrong reasons. So we need to see better federal integration uh, to get more in line with state in, uh, states in that respect. And then I guess the, the final little bit of it all is the tax uh, advantage and, and what that could uh, mean for, you know, not just state revenues, but obviously federal and, and federal programs. I mean, if we look at an industry that's very likely to grow to $80 billion to maybe $100 billion in direct sales per annum, uh, the tax revenue on that is, is, is tremendous. Uh, and obviously coming out of COVID would be uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, welcomed. Okay. So what about anything that you see as potential of a negative as, as far as federal legalization is concerned, maybe some of the framework that has been drawn up to this point here, is there anything that jumps out to you that uh, is concerning, I guess, at this point? Yeah, you know, there's the, from a macro perspective, any any reform is positive, even if it's just simple banking reform. Obviously, for for U.S. operators to have access to more traditional commercial lending, for example, that would that would help uh, significantly, and obviously the the safety aspect to employees that, that are in the industry. Um, you know, to as 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 far as maybe what the COA um, actually would would bring with full legalization and all, all the um, tax revenues that would come with it. But the negatives really are more on a micro level and, and it's really would come from a function of right now there's certain companies that are operating under a certain regime, a certain framework that they understand. And, and in some states, and many states are fully protected, they're actually building moats. If you look at a lot of states that have limited license that um, um, issued that uh, require full vertical integration, those are creating a certain type of business that, that operate in that framework, the risk of legalization and negative of the legalization, if it allows for full interstate commerce, for example, is how that changes the entire game. If we, it, it could become more like alcohol and tobacco, for example, probably will be. In that case, we don't need to have, you know, if you think of many of the multi-state operators that are operating on a fully vertically integrated basis in 10, 12, however many states, suddenly you don't need that. So that could really shift, um, you know, how you, re, how you deploy your, your capital, how you deploy resources. It could also start meaning that we move away from a limited license uh, type of market, which is somewhat, um, you know, protects obviously uh, prices and revenues, it would open it up for competition. So you'd see, like we've seen in, in Canada, uh, a more competitive market, which means uh, more margin compression <clears throat> quite possibly. So that's the negative is really not, not on the macro, the negative would be on the micro and how it affects businesses are being built for today's paradigm and then how they can transition into the, a new paradigm and also what new competition that brings in. Obviously, we've seen a lot of investment from the alcohol and tobacco industry right now waiting to see that uh, federal reform. Okay. 
And that's a perfect lead into the next one here. And this is probably the question I personally get the most. Uh, but how can the stocks that are specifically in MJ, which is our more globally oriented portfolio, uh, benefit from continued legalization, even though many of them are located in Canada? Yeah, that's a great question. I, and, and it's, you know, we obviously have MJUS, which, which uh, fully benefits from the, the fragmented, the fragmented uh, framework right now in the U.S., um, but could be disrupted going forward. But nevertheless, clearly, there's a tremendous short-term opportunity with MJUS. Um, I know a lot of, we have a lot of investors in MJ. And the question is, you know, how, how you're right, how do they compete? So, you know, if you look at the majority of the holdings, which are Canadian-based companies that have a global reach, I mean, the real opportunity is to expand through those distribution networks that they've partnered with. If you started to talk with Canopy Growth, I mean, they're, they're kind of the bellwether for the industry, uh, first unicorn in the space and the first one to get large institutional investment um, from Constellation Brands. Looking at Canopy, um, they have a few things. They have optionality to acquire acreage holdings. They have a direct and similar type, kind of opportunity with respect to Terrasend. So those are two large uh, MSOs in the US. So they would. Um, obviously, legalization will allow them to benefit. But beyond that, Canadian cannabis companies are really more than, than your traditional, um, I'll call it, you know, grower and licensed producer. They're really CPG companies that sell cannabis-related products. So what they're looking at is, is more than just the cannabis industry. They're looking at the wellness industry. They're looking at the beverage industry. They're looking at the pharmaceutical space. It's a whole tie-in and, and moving away from Canopy for a second. Obviously they have the, the distribution opportunity there with respect to the, the Constellation brands. I mean, at the end of the day, it's gonna be critical to get your brands out there is to get shelf space, right? So as it becomes legal and shelf space becomes available, having a partner like Constellation is how, how they will outperform. Looking at a company like Tilray, you know, they're building, they're, they're, they've, you know, they already have significant medical distribution globally. They're building their brands legally in Canada. They're refining uh, the, it, you know, what, what it is that consumers want, again, through their distribution in the US, uh, which they have through various partnerships, including the fact that they acquired Sweetwater Brewing. They're going to be able, again, to get that shelf space. So you know, again, going down the, 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 the checklist from um, you know, uh, Organogram to Hexo to Kronos, there's significant, uh, institutional investment in them that will help them leverage the products which are developing in a legal environment and then obviously deploy them incredibly efficiently on an interstate basis once we have legalization. That is really where they're going to excel. In the interim, um, most of these companies have, have operations in Europe, uh, which we've seen in Europe actually is over a billion dollars in sales last year. It's expected to almost double to two billion. Uh, there's several markets that, that have uh, medical marijuana markets in Europe, uh, but we're starting to see the re adult use recreational markets open up as well. So it's, again, a longer term opportunity in Europe. They're probably 15 to 20 years behind where the US and Canada is, uh, but projecting that forward and where it's going to go over 700 million people in the EU, that's a tremendous opportunity. So um, that's how, where the Canadian producers are really going to excel. It's the fact that they're, they're more than your, your um, you know, called Cannabis 1.0 or even 2.0, their full CPG companies are going to be able to actually start disrupting, for example, the wellness markets, the beverage markets, things like that. And then, of course, the rest of, of, of MJ is, is, you know, companies like Scott's Miracle Grow, a great example of a, a U.S.-based company that operates in full legal compliance, and they're benefiting from, you know, selling growing equipment uh, to, you know, individuals in, in, in states that can grow cannabis plants, but also on the institutional level as well. And, you know, we've also seen them make a recent um, investment in Riv Capital uh, to, uh, to look uh, to uh, acquiring MSOs and other types of cannabis assets that operate directly in the U.S. So, you know, there's, there's a number of companies, both Canadian and U.S. domicile, that have a lot of optionality have inroads today, but also have that next layer of optionality upon uh, cannabis reform. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned a few of the Canadian companies here, and these are the ones that come to mind, but many of the cannabis companies have replaced their CEOs in the last few years. Um, how have they been doing? You know, obviously some of them are coming from maybe more traditional industries, but, you know, how, how have we seen that transition take place? 
Yeah, so, you know, for the most part, the cannabis industry really started with, you know, again, when I, when I first got involved with the industry, um, a lot of medical marijuana operators that, that were looking to, you know, consolidate and, and scale. So you, you, you had a, a fringe kind of economy that was operated with people that understood that space. And as Canada moved to legalization, on an adult uh, recreational perspective, as the rest of the world started legalizing as well, we saw greater appetite, bigger balance sheets, more consolidation. And, and the game has changed. The game's changed significantly. There is, there is a lot of people operating these companies that raised early capital that arguably weren't the right folks to really take it to the next level. So the change we've seen is really bringing in um, you know, proper executive management that has that CPG type experience or has that pharmaceutical experience if that's what the focus is. Um, bringing in a board to give proper oversight with that. And, and that has happened as the, as the narrative of these, you know, this way these companies grown has really changed from having, you know, a plan based on narrative and what it could be to a plan based on, hey, we know what it is now and we just need to execute and we need to bring in the right people. So like many emerging industries, we're losing the entrepreneurs that got us here. Um, and we're really starting to replace those with the executives that are focused on better managing the balance sheet, growing revenues, and, and increasing operational efficiencies and margins uh, to pass on better returns to, uh, to shareholders. So we're, you know, we're seeing that across the board. That's true with the Canadian producers. It's equally true of the, uh, of the US producers. They're getting ready for legalization and they're acting and behaving again uh, what started as uh, a particularly fringe uh, type of industry, especially with the Ill uh, illegality, is as those countries are growing up. Those companies are growing up in a hurry. Okay. And then again, uh, with the one one merger in particular comes to mind here, the uh, the Tilray Afri move. But you see more further further consolidation, and um, you know how to sort of see that playing out. You kind of gave some examples before of some smaller. Uh, moves, you know, cross border or U.S. only, but you know, how do, how do you see that continue to play out? Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to continue to play out. I mean, if you if you look at it, if you want to start with with with, with Canada, for example. Uh, we've never had limited licenses up, up here. It's been a free for all from day one, but there was a rush of money to try to go out there and grab market share. So there's overbuilding in the space, too much capital, um, kind of thrown out. It's very similar to in many ways where we were with. You know, back in the dot com boom, and there was a ton of money chasing, you know, laying down fiber. And there, was, there was all being utilized now, but you know, 20, 30 years ago, that wasn't the case. So we've had an overbuilding in Canada, which means we're going to have winners and losers. There's certain companies that are doing well, they're growing, revenues are growing across the board, um, but certain companies are, are, are overburdened. So I think what we're going to see in Canada is con uh, continuous consolidation. Larger companies that, that are, that are, have solid operating mar margins and good market share are gonna to look to buy strategic assets, be it to enhance their medical portfolio or maybe it's, it's their recreational portfolio. Um, you're gonna to to see a similar uh, trend happening in the US as well. Again, it's going to be, and we're seeing this with certain of the MSOs, they're looking to get into certain states that have uh, limited license uh, markets where there's, there's only so many um, licenses issued. We've seen you know, recent activity uh, for example, Cresco acquiring Bloom and enter the, the Florida market. And there's, there's a lot of activity in Pennsylvania. So again, state by state, as new licenses are issued, uh, we'll continue to see consolidation in that space. And then ultimately we've seen global activity as well. Village Farms um, uh, actually just, uh, just um, worked to acquire ownership uh, of one of the um, um, producers in the Netherlands that has one of their 10 licenses. Uh, we saw Curaleaf uh, make a recent acquisition in the EU. Uh, so we're going to con continue to see that as well as all these, as the Canadian and US operators continue to their, uh, improve their uh, business platforms here in North America, um, we're going to see them as well continue to invest uh, overseas, uh, and potentially in Australia, but obviously immediately in, uh, in Europe. Okay. And uh, here's a question that actually aligns with somebody that uh, had submitted one through the Q&A, so I think we'll address it here. But uh, what do you attribute to the price pullback we've seen this year, especially within uh, you know, the stocks that are in MJ specifically? And obviously these companies, as you mentioned before, are, are you know, executing better and, and starting to really grow revenues in a, in a more sustainable way. Um, but what do you think would change that 
um, you know, that's kind of a two part question there. Yeah, no, it, it, and it's, you know, going back to the end of 2020 prior to the election, um, you know, the, the industry was, 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 we had this before. There was a lot of hype going, going back to 2018, 2019, a lot of hype, a lot of increase in, in prices. And then again, it didn't materialize as everyone expected. And, you know, so we saw this big run up and, and, and fall off. And, you know, through most of 2020, stock prices near the tail end were, were, were pretty flat. And then we had this catalyst and the catalyst was the U.S. election. And when it's the more it started to look like we'd have the you know, blue wave uh, with the Democrats in, in, in uh, full control of, of the House, of Senate, obviously uh, president, uh, president as well. Uh, again, that created a lot of expectation that we would see substantial, substantive reform, cannabis reform early, post-election. And so we really saw a run up in prices uh, through the end of 2020 and into 2021. And then a bit of anxiety with investors started, started creeping in. And, and that anxiety was, it came from the fact that we started getting well into 2021 and we weren't seeing any, you know, where was Schumer's bill? Where was it? We're getting some kind of conflicted messages from Biden, what he will or won't get behind. Um, things started to stall. And, and I think at the beginning of 2021, into the middle of 2021, it, it, there was this feeling like it's all going to get stalled out. And I mean, there's a million things that our elective representatives have to deal with right now. <laughs> Infrastructure, you know, COVID, everything that's going on with the defense bill that has to get through. There's so many distractions. I think the worry, the anxiety really started to creep in over the last few months that, wow, this is not gonna happen. Um, but you know what, what's interesting is out of the blue, suddenly the Safe Banking Act gets added to the defense bill, right? And now we're seeing again today where there's, there's the MORE Act is sitting with the Judicial Committee. That's gonna be coming forward. Obviously this is gonna force um, the CAOA revision of that to get, the, you know, to, to see what that comes to. So we're starting now again to get to this point where we're in that little bit of a lull. We're in that kind of low spot now. We're kind of bouncing around the bottom, but we're starting to get momentum from a legis uh, legislative perspective. We're, you know, there's a good chance for reform and we're coming up to that ticking clock, that kind of November 2022 clock. So, you know, we're starting to see more volume. We're starting to see more enthusiasm. Volatility starting to trickle up again. You know, my, my, my gut is we're going to start seeing more reform and again, more interest in the space. But that, you know, more or less, this is what happens. I mean, anxiety creeping in that, hey, we all thought reform was going to happen. It didn't. And, and the long, you know, it, 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 it's when it doesn't happen, you know, people start to lose interest and or redeploy. But, you know, again, now we're getting to that point where clearly there's lots of action right now on the Hill. Okay. So uh, this question is probably more so intended uh, for Chris here, but um, you know, obviously the, the short-term and long-term benefits here, we, we've got questions about you know, what, are, what are some of those things as it applies to the cannabis industry and, and how are some ways to play it? I'm gonna share my screen briefly. Uh, we've only got one slide total here, uh, but let me just see if this is... Can everyone see that? Looks good to me. Okay, so Chris, maybe you can uh, again highlight some ways to play it here. Um, you know, these funds are, are done in partnership with both ETF Managers Group, Prime Indexes, um, and can you just sort of uh, walk us through this list a little bit? Yep, sure. Thank you, Alex. Um, so, so, so four funds here. Um, this is the entire suite of cannabis ETFs offered by uh, ETF Managers Group. Uh, the first and and one we've talked about a little bit today, and, and I'm sure everyone on the call is familiar with MJ. The world's largest cannabis ETF. It tracks the prime alternative harvest index. Uh, it gets long exposure to the global cannabis industry, uh, whereas the next ETF, MJUS, gives exposure to just companies operating in the United States, which is the largest cannabis marketplace in the world uh, by far. Um, third, we've got MJXL. Uh, which is a 2x leveraged long ETF giving exposure to the daily returns of the alternative harvest index. So 2x leveraged long for, for investors who have a uh, extremely bullish view on the sector uh, and who have short-term time horizon. Um, and then we've got MJIN, which gives um, inverse exposure to the alternative harvest index. Again, that is uh, a daily resetting product and it's 2X leveraged inverse exposure. 
uh, for investors who have a bearish view with a short-term investment horizon. Um, note MJIN is not currently listed. It's going to list hopefully next week uh, on Wednesday, October 6th. Um, and also I would highlight uh, MJXL and MJIN are both daily resetting products. Um, and as a result of their uh, daily reset requirement, the fund manager uh, each day has to um, reset the portfolio back to two times leverage. As a result of that activity, um, the fund will have uh, compounding of its daily returns. Um, and so uh, ultimately what that means is, is returns over a longer period of time are going to be meaningfully more or less than two times um, what your expected return is. So, which is why the, the time horizons of these types of products is always best for short-term traders or hedgers. Um, if anybody wants, uh, you know, to get more um, discussion about the mechanics or the risks associated with investing in 2X leverage daily resetting products or 2X uh, inverse daily resetting products, uh, just, you know, feel free to give ETF managers group a call and they can walk you through it. Um, again, I would just stress that both of those products are for investors with short-term investment horizons. Um, so, so to recap, we've got MJ, which is the world's largest cannabis ETF. We have MJUS for investors who just want to invest in the U.S. cannabis industry. We've got MJXL for people who want uh, leveraged exposure to the global cannabis industry, uh, again, for short-term horizons, and MJIN uh, for investors who have bearish views who want 2x uh, inverse exposure to the daily returns of the cannabis index. Um, so, so those are those are all the products. It's every flavor you want for investing in cannabis, um, and uh, and that's it for me. I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you, Alex. Thanks, Chris. So, yes, uh, as Chris alluded to, we are looking to equip investors with all the tools to express their viewpoint on uh, the cannabis industry and and be sort of that the one place having everything to uh, to offer and gets us to our last question here as far as what we had prepared and uh you know I, jason you had mentioned before you know scott's miracle grow is sort of a story stock but any other individual stocks you think it makes sense to highlight here is doing some interesting things in the space that uh you know maybe some investors weren't aware of yeah i, I think that you know if you, if, if you look at the the global producers it's 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 hard not to look at tilray and be impressed with what they're doing um, so Tilray is the, the, you know, the newly combined entity of the Freya and, and, and Tilray, um, strong balance sheet, uh, strong revenue growth. They have, you know, what's so fascinating about them is the fact that, you know, not only they have, they, they have significant market share in Canada, that's, that's great with the benefit that, that they're getting out of that is they're understanding what the consumer wants. They have visibility into where products are going and they have the means and expertise to develop those. Um, when, when you look at, the, the, you know, how do they get that into the U.S. market? Well, they 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 have a number of facets and they have a number of approaches. Uh, they, they acquired Sweetwater, um, which is a, a boutique brewer that, that um, is is really appealing to that trans, you know, that can of curious consumer that's out there. The, you know, to help people transition from alcohol uh, to cannabis. Um, the fact that they have that knowledge, that brand, that distribution network is going to help them bring those 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 beverages there but they also have own manitoba harvest which is you know a, a wellness company so you you look at they're bringing fully us compliant products to the market right now and you know when you look at the leadership at uh, tilray i mean that's what they've done in the past and to build a wellness brand and 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 listening to where they're going is they want to be one of the largest cannabis companies in the world, but they want to be more than that. They want to be the largest CPG cannabis focused brand in the world. And, and, you know, I think Erwin Simon said it best when he's, you know, I love to own my oversized market share in the cannabis space globally. Um, but beyond that, I really want to own market share in the beverage industry which is multiples of, of what the cannabis industry will be, because it touches on everything from you know, your traditional spirits, wine, uh, beer, but also includes um, all our functional beverages, sports drinks, energy drinks, uh, things of that nature, all the rehydration products we're seeing. And that's where we can see significant 
scale um, in those derivative products. So it's fascinating to see what Tilray is doing there. And then of course, the, the, the big medical uh, opportunity in Europe, the fact that they have cultivation over there, GMP certified cultivation um, and dis uh, pharmaceutical distribution up and operating in Europe gives them a fantastic competitive uh, advantage over there. So Tilray is a really interesting package, a good example of a company that, that is well positioned to expand uh, globally, both domestically here in North America, but also over in the EU. Um, other companies, I, I, you know, speaking to MJUS, again, it's, it's hard to not look at Cureleaf and, and like what they're doing. They operate in, in over uh, 20 states right now, um, incredible revenue growth. And, and you know, they're, they're, they understand as well that this really cannabis is going to be all about branded products. So it's, to them, they're understanding how to create those products, how to, to create those durable brands and then how to distribute them. The big question mark with, with Cureleaf and every other US operator is, you know, what that framework is going to, to look like going forward. But I mean, these companies are succeeding today. If you look at the companies in MG, MJUS, even though the, that US sector has actually, you know, sold off as, a, as of late, it's done so on stronger fundamentals across the board, the cannabis industry, Canadian, US, you name it, fundamentals are improving, prices are going the other way. And again, maybe there was an overshoot back in November, but these companies are, are, uh, are, are clearly uh, positioned to do well in the long run. And then the final one I always like to look at is I do like Scott's Miracle Grow. I mean, the fact that they're a very early player in the game. You look at what they've done with their Hawthorne division. It's, in, you know, the, the revenue growth there has been tremendous. And, you know, sometimes you can make more money selling, selling uh, shovels and actually digging for gold. So they've taken that approach um, and they've, they're, they're taking uh, that opportunity to work with the licensed cannabis producers, is that there's a couple in Canada they're working with, uh, to be able to actually understand and prove how to create better growing equipment. And that's going to help them, you know, better penetrate that industrial side of the market. And at the same time, partnering up with Rift Capital to have exposure to the recreational space, I think is smart as well. They, you know, again, it's a company that's, that's diversified already. Adding this to it, I, you know, it'll be, they're, they're going to be a, a very interesting player in the space as we see legalization in the US. Okay. So we had a few questions from our participants and actually you mentioned Cureleaf and the US operators. Uh, and I think that's a good transition to one of the questions here, but uh, wondering if banking reform is really the, the only thing required for, you know, Cureleaf to use as, as an example, uh, but to uplist from the OTC markets and would allow for more institutional uh, investment within those companies. Is, is banking reform going to be the, the catalyst for that? So banking reform on its own won't, won't get that, at least not the banking reform we have right now. What the Safe Banking Act uh, would provide is commercial lending. So it would provide a safe harbor for federally regulated banks to take deposits and to potentially lend money. Uh, so it would help Cureleaf in the fact that uh, it would make their transaction easier. Uh, obviously they could take regular credit card, debit, you name it. Um, it's not a, you know, you don't have to send uh, however many hundreds of thousands of $20 bills pay your tax bill to the IRS. Uh, so operationally it will help, uh, but it won't help with respect to, to your, your core capital markets functions, uh, nor will it get the exchange listings either. So it's just a safe harbor for your, I'll call it your core banking services, um, but it, 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 it's, uh, that's where it stops. And, and that is the reason why the Safe Banking Act hasn't gone through is it just, look, there's, a, there's tremendous bipartisan support for cannabis reform, but, but there's a significant majority of that that wants it to see more than just a safe harbor for banking. Uh, especially, you know, it will help minority enterprises, minority owned enterprises, minority communities, uh, but not to the extent that having some of the social equity pieces and reform of justice pieces in there as well. So, um, but anyhow, sorry, to answer the question directly, it will be help, helpful. Um, to all multi-state operators, but no, you won't see them on NASDAQ or, or the NYSE because of it. Understood. Okay. Uh, we'll go back to our first question here. And it's something you sort of touched on, um, you know, as relates to where certain things sort of stand right now legislatively, but um, just some questions on sort of the uh, social reform and questions on growth of minority women-owned U.S. cannabis companies, anything that you kind of have a, a key into there and can elaborate on. I know that, you know, where I am in New Jersey, that's something that they're going back and forth on and, and rolling out some, some laws pertaining to that. And how do you see that fed, uh, playing out federally? 
So federally, uh, it, it's it's what they're a large part of what they're looking at is obviously having a tax component uh, to any legislation that's passed, and uh, part of those tax obviously the, the revenues from those taxes would go to all various uh, social equity programs. So that that's where the movement is. That is where uh, you know the Moore Act and the CAOA have have really stepped up and expanded. The CAO, CAOA really drives home, uh, but, but it's also part of the criticisms against it. And in, in many ways, it's it's probably gone too far and is too all encompassing to get um, you know enough uh, 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 enough support uh, to get it through. Um, you know, up to a 25% federal tax could be crippling to the industry. Uh, yes, even though, you know, getting rid of 280E, uh, so we don't have the tax drag in U.S. operators would be great. You know, 25% tax on sales surely doesn't help. Um, and then there's always going to be some level of debate of how far we go with restorative justice. Um, you know, we've, uh, at the end of the day, expungement can make sense but there's a fine line between being in jail for uh, you know, simple possession to being in jail to something related to possession that's, that's gone a little bit farther than that. So th this is where you know, devil's in the details, and, uh, um, but the, the, most, the, 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 uh, the, the most probable thing to come through for sure, and I'd be surprised if we see reform without it, is having a, a, some kind of tax component that, that uh, uh, funds social equity programs across the nation. Okay. Um, and then we just got a question in here uh, about, you know, what do you see the, U I guess the U.S. doing differently or similarly? I'm assuming this is in relation to Canada's federal rollout, but how do you sort of see the similarities or differences playing out between the two countries here once we do get to the point of federal legalization here? Yeah, I, 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 I think the, the general difference is the, you know, and I believe will be is the federal government will, the most likely response is to, to have the, the federal government have a light hand on it, a light touch, and just let the states run their business. So it, it's, it, it, it'll probably be as simple as that. Let's get proper banking reform. Let's get some level of social equity and restorative justice. Let's fix what needs to be fixed and let's allow the states that choose to legalize carry on with their program. So versus taking a more across the board approach uh, uh, that we've seen in, 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 in Canada with a, you know, a greater touch from the federal level, I would expect that we would see more of a, uh, as we tend to in the US, let's just let the states that choose to legalize, let them do it, let them do it effectively, let them do it in a safe environment. Um, and it, it's, I think the, the, the winning piece of legislation that, that provides that is, is the one that's going to get through later next year. Okay. And our final question here, uh, and this is actually one that I get quite a bit um, and probably should have included on original ones here, but this is certainly an interesting question as it relates to sort of industries past cannabis. I'm thinking of psychedelics, I'm thinking of a few other things that uh, you know, I've sort of come to the forefront in the last few years, both from a medical perspective and I guess eventually maybe recreationally. Um, are, are, is there any crossover with any of the companies that fall within our portfolios? And how do you see the similarities, I guess, between the, between, you know, the cannabis industry and then maybe sort of the next level uh, of that, you know, in, in terms of psychedelics and things like that? Yeah, I think there's some great opportunity for crossover because, you know, if you look at what's happening in the psychedelic space, it's it's a similar kind of movement, you know, it's, it, it's and, and there's similar issues related to it, uh, both on the medical side, but, but also on, on the, uh, on the called the, the, the social equity and restorative justice side. So there's, you know, what, it's, it's education, it's education, education, and getting the right information. I mean, I was just, just watching the, the judicial committee um, and, and it, it's, you know, there's, 330, 340 million people in the US. Not everyone has the same experiences. Not everyone thinks the same way. There is a lot of stigma on anything drug related. I mean, so much banter going back and forth today that one of the reasons not to legalize marijuana is because it's gonna be another opiate crisis. And, and that's just, you know, I think for anyone that's in the space and understands cannabis knows that that's not true, but it doesn't change the perception. So what the crossover I see is ability to bring this, this information that's been beaten down, hidden through the war on drugs 
understanding that and getting that out to the medical community, getting out to the, to the research community and actually translating that message. There's been a lot of work done with that in the, in the marijuana and the cannabis industry so far. I could really see the psychedelic industry uh, benefiting from that same framework and getting that same education, again, to get proper legislative reform uh, to help promote their industry. Okay. Well, I guess we'll, uh, we'll leave it there in that case. I uh, want to thank Chris and Jason for joining us this afternoon. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us, info at etfmg.com. Our website, etfmg.com, will have more information about those ETFs that, uh, that Chris took us through before. And thank you again for all of our participants for joining.